Thank you for joining us. We will begin in just a few moments. We're waiting for a few more people to join us. Hello everyone. I'd like to welcome you to this second program in Vanderbilt COVID Commodore Classroom Series, Public Health in the COVID Era, Community Response and Equity Driven Changes. My name is Kitty Norton. I'm the Associate Dean for Development for Vanderbilt Divinity School. Thank you all for joining us today. We are honored to have our moderator, Emily M. Towns, Dean of Vanderbilt Divinity School and E. Rhodes and Leona B. Carpenter Chair in Womenist Ethics and Society, and our distinguished panelists from Vanderbilt School of Medicine, Vanderbilt Divinity School, the College of Arts and Science, School of Nursing, and Peabody. Thank you all for joining us. And now I turn things over to Dean Towns to begin our program. Dean? Thank you, Kitty. It is good to see, well, to see all my colleagues here and to know that there are many of you out in the audience. Let me get right to um, the um, topic of today. We asked our panelists to think through this question. Communities of color and those experiencing homelessness are being hit disproportionately hard by COVID. With a focus on access, underlying health issues, and socioeconomic factors, what has COVID revealed and how can the country do better for the long term? Our panelists will come with their individual answers in this order and they will begin as soon as I finish introducing them. Consuelo Wilkins, MD, who is Executive Director of Meharry Vanderbilt Alliance, Professor of Medicine, Vanderbilt University Medical Center, Associate Professor of Medicine, Meharry College. Derek Griffith, Professor of Medicine, Health and Society, and Director of the Center for Research on Men's Health at Vanderbilt University. Christian Cadell, Assistant Professor of Nursing and clinical manager of the Mercy Court Clinic. Beth Shin, Cornelius Vanderbilt Professor of Human and Organizational Development. And our final panelist, Teresa Smallwood, Associate Director of the Public Theology and Racial Justice Collaborative at Vanderbilt Divinity School. They will go in that order I will be timing them at five minutes per, and then we hope to open up to some of the questions that some of you have sent in. Dr. Wilkins. Thank you so much for the opportunity to uh, join uh, colleagues today. Uh, I'm going to start with some of the work that we've been doing in the medical center that's focused on health equity. Um, as part of our response broadly to uh, COVID-19, there is a command center and uh, I was asked to join that command center specifically to focus on health equity uh, with a group of other collaborators from around the medical center, um, physicians, nurses, social workers, um, individuals who are focused on operations as well as clinical trials uh, came together to come up with this work stream that you see here. 
the focus is fivefold. We wanted to make sure we were addressing how to effectively communicate risk to the communities, specifically focusing on racial and ethnic minorities, uh, and individuals from socioeconomically disadvantaged backgrounds. But we also wanted to focus on our employees, including those who might not identify as healthcare workers, but working in the healthcare environment in critical roles such as dietary maintenance and environmental services. We wanted to make sure that we were providing testing uh, equitably and making it available to all individuals who are at risk, uh, that there were no differences in, in care uh, by race, ethnicity, socioeconomic status. Uh, and because there's no proven effective treatment in COVID-19, we also wanted to make sure that clinical trials were being made available in equitable ways and that individuals from different backgrounds were being included. Because COVID-19 required us to do what we're doing today, operate virtually, uh, we wanted to make sure that as this shift uh, to more telehealth visits didn't leave people behind. Um, as part of that work, one of the first things we did was to request a dashboard where we could disaggregate the data, um, the testing data by race, ethnicity, and language. Uh, what we found within the VUMC data uh, is that there were no differences um, from the general population for African Americans and Latinos, although we're certainly seeing this across the country. Uh, we did see that for individuals who identify as Hispanic or Latinx, um, a higher percent positive within those groups. Similarly, although we have very few American Indians, uh, that group had higher rates of positivity. Uh, and we found some interesting things, this has also been reported across the country, that uh, a high percentage of people, about 12 and a half percent of people, we didn't actually know their race or ethnicity. Uh, this is a little bit lower than what we're seeing across the country, but still very significant. Uh, I think we're one of the few places that are at least reporting uh, on data by language. And so when we look at the uh, more than uh, 45,000, nearly 46,000 people who've been, the first 46,000 people who've been tested uh, for, for the coronavirus at Vanderbilt, there are 48 different languages that are spoken. And among individuals for whom English is not their primary language, 26% um, of those tested have a positive test compared to for individuals who speak English, only about 6% are positive. So this actually was very interesting in some ways, um, shocking and frightening, uh, as we needed to adjust and shift to make sure that we're actually addressing the needs of these communities uh, for whom English isn't their first language. We also looked at where people lived and uh, found that for those who, the two zip codes with the highest percentage positive or two adjacent zip codes in the southeastern part of Nashville in the Antioch and Nolensville areas. And these communities actually uh, are known to have higher percentages of refugee and immigrant residents there. You can see there about a third of individuals living in these zip codes have languages, speak languages other than English. And we found that many of them are actually um, working in essential jobs. Um, what we did was make sure we shared this, of course, with the public health programs, uh, both the Metro Department of Health as well as the state because they weren't collecting data on language uh, consistently. Uh, but we also wanted to, to partner with community organizations uh, who are trusted community resources and make sure that we were actually providing them with the relevant information and getting it out to the community. And so, uh, so far just with these three that you see on the screen with El Mahaba, Conexion, uh, and the Health Disparities Collaborative of Nashville, uh, we've reached more than 10,000 people uh, in the area. It's still not enough. We still have work to do as we continue to see increases in COVID-19 among uh, these populations um, and uh, growing trends, particularly among the Hispanic Latinx community and people who speak languages other than English. I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you. And right on the dot, I must compliment you and encourage your fellow panelists to follow your fine example. Dr. Griffith. 
Good morning. Um, well, let me first say thank you to you, Dean Towns, and to the Divinity School for organizing this event. Um, it's great to be here with all of my colleagues. Um, I'm going to try to, again, follow good Dr. Wilkins' example, as I always usually try to do anyway, of sticking to my time. Um, and I just want to make really two points. One is um, to answer your question about what has COVID revealed. For me, it reveals the limitations in how we tend to approach public health problems. And the way that, and, and so I'm going to talk about that. The second part that I think it reveals is how we explain um, these kind of problems and the disparities that we see are going to dictate what we consider success and where we put our energies and efforts. And the fact that we have a flawed sort of problem definition leads to us having a flawed implementation plan and why we're seeing the differences that we're seeing here today. So um, with my colleagues actually in the Center for Research on Men's Health, we actually just submitted a blog that used this analogy of, or the parable of the blind man and the elephant. And I'm gonna use that actually today. Um, where we talked about um, basically the elephant being, COVID is the elephant and um, the ways that we are approaching COVID have been sort of the blind man. So we've approached it through the lens of race, we've approached it through the lens of place, and we've thought about it in relation to gender. We've seen the heat maps, we've all seen the heat maps in Nashville, um, is a version of that, um, that Dr. Wilkins just showed of where you're seeing the concentration of cases. You've seen the data that she just showed by race. You can also add language as she just so eloquently described. And we know that men are dying at higher rates of COVID than women, even though they're contracting COVID at about the same rate. So the problem is that when we looked at these data and we presented the data, we've tended to look at it through each of these lenses separately, as opposed to realizing that people aren't living in one place of a particular gender or sex, of a particular race or ethnicity separately. They're all of those things simultaneously, but yet we're approaching this problem as though we can address it by sort of adding these pieces together. And that's led to a very disconnected strategy for us being able to address these kinds of issues. And so I would just say that, um, so that's kind of the first big point. The second big point related to that is because we've sort of had this very piecemeal strategy, how we've explained the disparities um, has been very different. And so if you think about the approaches that we've used as it relates to place and sort of requiring people to, when they're going into certain places, wear a mask and do those kinds of things. The race issue has been an interesting one because for example, with African-Americans, initially it was thought that black people were immune to COVID. Um, and then the, the thought was we were hyper um, sensitive to COVID. And so you saw this very strange sort of pattern and then all these other things that have been associated with race as well that we've seen this sort of pattern um, really exist and certainly um, that's been its own sort of problem and issue. Um, we, there's always an issue with how we, and contentious issue with the issue of gender and sex as it relates to COVID and um, not gonna do my class thing of trying to disentangle the two and, um, I, you know, but I do want to sort of highlight the fact that we know, I know that those two are different, so, so I'm just leaving that there. Um, but for the sake of this, I do want to just highlight that when we've seen these differences where men tend to do worse, the way that we've tended to approach it is to basically say that, well, the reason that men tend to do worse in these kind of areas is because of things related to masculinity. And it usually has something to do with a gendered explanation that has to do with men's psychology or ways of approaching the world. And we don't really tend to approach other populations with that very narrow um, frankly, short-sighted way of approaching populations. We tend to look at things from zoom out a bit and at least look at the structural factors that consider and shape those kinds of populations. So I would say that the fact that men are, are dying of this at the same rate, but not um, contracting it at necessarily higher rates suggests that there's something else going on that may or may not, that's not necessarily biological either. And so we can't just also you know, quickly look to these biological explanations to solve these problems. But when we come up with a solution or we come up with better strategies, I think many of you may have seen the New York Times piece this morning that showed that we're the only high income country that where the cases are dramatically increasing everywhere else in the world that's sort of our economic peer, the cases are actually declining. So there's something about the strategy that we're using here that is problematic that we really need to change. 
So let me stop there. Thank you. So uh, thank you, Dr. Griffith. Um, my name is Christian Cadle. I am um, the director of the Clinic at Mercury Courts, and we are a um, clinic that was designed um, really exclusively to be a couple of things. One um, is interprofessional. Um, we really try to gather the, the, the expertise and minds of multiple different professions um, you know, to meet the needs of our community. Um, the second thing that we are is um, is that we are um, try to try to be as um, integrated and provide as many wraparound services as possible. So, where Consuelo really talked about kind of the big picture of COVID nineteen response in Nashville and what it looks like, um, me and my team we really are um, in the micro level. I mean, we are on the streets, um, literally. So. Um, you know, just a little bit of background about the clinic um, uh, demographics. Um, so mainly our clinic population is, um, about 82% of our population is lives below the 200% um, of poverty and about 38% actually live below. Um, our mean income is generally ranges year to year from about $10,000 uh, per, uh, per person or per household to uh, about 12,000. So, really a lot of social economical disparities. Um, our, we have about 37% of our patients have been previously incarcerated. Um, and one of the programs that we work with is Dismas House, which is a um, program for re-entry. And that's one of our, our largest community partners that we've been working with. And then the other one is um, folks that have previous, previously or are currently experiencing homelessness. And Dr. Shin will talk a lot more about that. Um, I think that uh, the, the other thing that you really have to understand about this clinic is that we are, um, our, our sole job is to, is to mitigate any barrier that someone has to high quality health care. And um, I want to take just my opportunity to thank um, Vanderbilt University um, for helping establish this clinic, the School of Nursing, um, and VUMC. Um, it, this is an alumni presentation, so I would be remiss without just thanking them so much for the great su support. I would say um, of a hundred, you know, out of the hundred percent of decisions that have been made um, by them, I would say that that ninety nine percent of them have been um, have been the right thing to do, and I know one hundred percent of them have come from the heart. So it has really been um, remarkable to work for for both for all of these organizations. Um, our COVID response in the clinic has really come from our um, trust within the community. I think that, um, you know, trying to come into a community and not have an established trust basis is, you're really, I don't, I don't know how you have expectations to make a, a large impact. Um, so the, um, you know, so what we've done over the, over the years is, is that we, we really treat our community like we treat our individuals. When a, person walks into the clinic, we don't expect uh, to, you know, to tell them exactly what to do for their health. We're going to do, we're going to get to know them. We're going to find out their motivations. We're going to find their strengths and we're going to work with them. And we try to do that with the community as well. For instance, our COVID response, um, immediate micro response here that we've done in our community has been, um, number one, um, the community but he likes to talk in person. And so what we've done is establish weekly rounds in the community where we go sit on porches and discuss, um, discuss uh, the, uh, you know, the current um, COVID-19 best practices for keeping yourself safe. Um, you know, we have um, developed a, uh, a, the trust within the community to come to us when they're not feeling well or they have questions for testing. Um, and then, uh, tracing, I'll tell you, it just makes tracing so much easier when someone trusts you and they're positive and you say like, well, who have you had, in, who have you had contact with? It's not an immediate response that, you know, well, why are you asking? It's because they, they truly do want to help their community. So, um, and then the other big aspect of the COVID um, response that we've done is we've implemented a, um, a, a very aggressive support of isolation where when somebody is either isolated or um, COVID positive, we, we uh, provide them with, we do an assessment and do a wraparound and figure out all of their social needs. So 
you know, I could talk forever. I got about 10 more seconds. So I just wanted to thank the Alumni Association and the panel and, um, and then look forward to your questions. Thank you. Dr. Shin. Uh, thank you so much for having me. So my focus is on homelessness, which is arguably the worst manifestation of inequality in society. And even before COVID, uh, there were large disparities by race in who experienced homelessness. Uh, it was disproportionately visited on African American, Native American communities, and Latinx people are disproportionately in crowded housing that puts them at risk for COVID. COVID has simply exacerbated these patterns. Uh, congregate shelters are places where you can't isolate uh, and follow uh, social distancing. Uh, one result is that the Nashville Rescue Min Mission had 100 cases of COVID positivity uh, before we opened overflow shelters in the fairgrounds. Uh, the CDC has actually recommended not clearing encampments uh, at this point because being out of doors, drinking from streams, having no sanitation is safer than the alternatives uh, for people who experience homelessness. The good news is that we know how to end homelessness by offering people affordable housing. Some people need more. Supportive housing uh, is successful with people with serious mental illnesses and long histories of homelessness and substance abuse disorders, but everybody needs housing. And housing alone uh, that's affordable is sufficient to end homelessness for most families. Immediately, we need to get people who are at high risk for COVID or who test positive into private hotel rooms or apartments, the kind of supportive isolation uh, that Dr. Kettle was talking about. In the slightly longer term, we can use federal CARES funding to offer people housing and to subsidize their rent. And if we're smart, we can use these shorter term subsidies to bridge to long-term subsidies that hold rent to 30% of people's income. There aren't currently in enough of those long-term subsidies to go around to everybody who's eligible for them. But the bipartisan housing senator estimated that with just $31 billion per year, uh, we could offer these kinds of long-term subsidies to everybody whose income is below 30% of area median. That is, people who are uh, more or less at the poverty line and below. We can end homelessness. We have the knowledge. We just need the political will. Thank you. Thank you. The use of the term comorbidity. You ready for me? Yes. Okay. The use of the term comorbidity, the simultaneous presence of two or more chronic diseases or conditions in a patient immediately garners the attention of most. As the culprit for why such disproportionality exists in the alarmist statistics we're seeing around mo morbidity in COVID-19. In this country, the overwhelming consensus is that the social determinants of health draw a direct line between these comorbidities and the compendium on which the notion of essential versus expendable rests. Essential workers are often the ones deemed expendable in healthcare and healthcare access. And this is particularly evidenced by the fact that environmental factors such as clean water or air free from pollutants impact morbidity rates generally. While I understand that studying the association between social position and morbidity is complex because social position includes several dimensions, it is clear to me that the study of social inequalities in health are imperative in this moment. The National Medical Association, which represents roughly 50,000 African-American physicians, looked at six social determinants of health, economic stability, physical environment, education, food community, social content, and healthcare systems. And the NMA concluded, and I quote, these statistics are just an amplification of the health, of the slave health deficit, which has been an aftermath of years of discrimination, unequal treatment and injustices in healthcare, criminal justice and employment, and the list really goes on. The Flint water crisis looms large in this analysis. So that if we know that poor housing conditions, 
home dampness with increased house dust mites and gas stove usage are associated with respiratory symptoms and lower social status. I contend that these revelations are symptomatic of a deeper, more embedded reality that we must face as a nation, the concept of environmental racism. If we know that mold in a home can cause respiratory illness, we must fashion regulatory parameters. Laws pertaining to housing eviction should involve a dimension that requires landlords to comport so that housing uh, warranties of habitability eliminate the potential morbidities. If a child is known to be diabetic and child's family faces uh, homelessness, this signals a public health issue. Morbidity problems associated with medication, with the refrigeration of that medication, with eviction laws. In her book, Breaking the Fine Rain of Death, published in 1998, our moderator drew correlation between the social determinants of health and morbidity. And she suggests that health is a cultural production. How we respond to the various environments around us determines much about our health. However, we cannot lose sight of the fact that we must examine and understand the environments in which we live because these two factors, our environments and our response to them, are key in understanding pathways to health and healing. Thank you. Thank you, and thank you all for um, being kind enough to give us um, time to also open up for some of the questions from the audience. So let me get to that uh, as quickly as I can. First, uh, first question for anyone on the panel. In fact, I'd like to hear all of you say something about it. I find it hard to have any conversations about public health we do not, we do a lot of talking, but very little educating. I find few people know the difference between Medicare and Medicaid, but are impassioned to talk about getting rid of private insurance and Medicare for all, while at the same time they are rolled in private Medicare Advantage plans. And I've heard someone rail against healthcare.gov while praising the creation of the health insurance marketplace via the ACA. So, how do we talk about public health, apples to apples, when your apple is a table lamp and my apple is bubble gum? I'll, I'll jump in and say, um, I'm not sure I've heard that comparison of <laughs> table lamp and bubble gum. So I'm still trying to wrap my mind around that one. But uh, no doubt uh, the, the way that we pay for uh, health care in this country is complex. And I certainly agree that many people, including um, health care providers, clinicians, physicians, don't fully understand uh, Medicare, Medicaid, um, and um, and the insurance, health insurance. Uh, so I, I and I think unfortunately we're often taught in in medicine as health professionals that we don't need to worry about that. That our responsibility is really to to take care of the patients and families or clients in front of us. Uh, and so I think the complexity and then the lack of sort of making it purposeful and intentional uh, adds to the confusion. But I would say as it relates to public health. Uh, one bigger issue for us is that public health and the health system, the health care system are, are not well connected. Uh, and uh, we, we make too many decisions independent of the social domains or social determinants of, of health. Uh, and, and that also adds to the, you know, we are prioritizing providing care for people who are sick as opposed to uh, prevention and providing really the basic needs for people to stay healthy. Thank you. 
Would anybody else like to jump in? Sure, I can um, jump in. I mean, I think the first thing in just as I sort of am processing the question, um, part of the challenge I think in having a conversation about health or public health is that we tend to combine or conflate or mix up the distinction between healthcare and health and public health. That just because you provide somebody access to health care does not necessarily mean that's going to improve their overall health. Part of what you see in COVID is the fact that a lot of things that are happening outside of the care, the care system, outside of a doctor's visit, are things that are actually very much affecting health. So as Dr. Wilkins was saying, how we connect what happens outside of the doctor's office with what happens in the doctor's office is really what we call population health. And so the need to really understand how those pieces fit together and the cracks between them. I think the other part of what I heard in the question is the politicalization of health and healthcare and all these things and how people are making choices based on, you know, the different sources of who they see and trust um, and the kinds of information that they value really coming at it through much more of a political lens than necessarily really trying to or being able to really disentangle and make sense of the information themselves. And so if you're a particular person or have a particular political viewpoint that would suggest that, you know, you may be willing to try um, some kinds of drugs that don't haven't quite been tested or some kinds of household products you may consume or you know, do those kinds of things that because somebody of your particular political orientation um, suggested would be a potential solution. If they're sort of discounting this whole issue of wearing masks from the beginning of the pandemic to saying, well, you know, um, we don't need to do this. This is not important. We will be fine. This is just like the flu. But those things have been politicized in ways that we're not really paying attention to. So I think it's really part of the difficulty in having the conversation is the lack of clarity in terms, but also the way that these things are politicized. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? I would, you know, I just kind of, when I go out and I talk to folks about um, Medicare, Medicaid, and I talk public, I mean, I'm really talking um, almost in a level of, um, you know, not differentiating, you know, the difference between, you know, pu like public health, I really feel is more kind of a scientific, you know, uh, endeavor to find ways and uh, to find ways to better treat the population and, and, and everything that we're talking about today, where I, where I really, I have better conversations with people when I talk about community health and I, and I kind of explain our, our philosophy of really communities are, you know, a real um, definable way to, um, you know, a group of, group of people, you know, whether it's geographical or however you want to look at it, it is, you know, that, um, that are different and are unique. And so when we come into, we have a clinic here at Mercury Courts and we, you know, I don't assume that one, uh, you know, motivation and um, that work at Mercury Courts is going to work in North Nashville. You know, I'm going to go out, I'm going to have a conversation. Um, I'm going to, I'm going to, really try to understand the community before I make assumptions about what's best for them. I make assumptions for what I, I, I make my assumptions based on the needs that they report to me. Um, how that addresses the apples to, to lamps and bubble gum, you know, it really is, um, you know, it gets into, I mean, that's a difficult situation because like Dr. Wilkins said, I mean, the, the, the I mean, she's right. I mean, I run into providers that don't know the difference between Medicare and Medicaid um, because it's complex. I mean, they're federal, you know, the, what are the common as they're federal programs, you know, what's the difference between that and private insurance, all of those lines are getting blurred and seem to change pretty rapidly. So I, I think just, you know, what I would say to this questioner is just don't get, don't get discouraged about make, having those conversations um, and, um, and just continue to have those conversations because without those conversations, our communication breaks down and we, we can't make any change. So that would be my response. Thank you. Dr. Shin or Dr. Smallwood, would you like to weigh in? Well, I think folks have, have pretty much covered it. Um, I think in terms of informing the public, which was part of the question, 
um, we really need to listen to our public health uh, folks. We have public health uh, trained people around the country uh, giving us advice right now about wearing masks, about social distancing, uh, about what's safe and what's not uh, in particular environments, and we need to pay attention to that. The health insurance system is a pretty different animal, and in some ways I don't want a physician to know whether somebody's got Medicaid or Medicare or private insurance. I want them to just treat the, the patient. Uh, but I think the COVID crisis shows us, um, as so many people have lost their medical insurance, their health insurance, uh, when they've lost their jobs, uh, the difficulties of the U.S. system, which relies so much on employers uh, uh, to provide health insurance. Um, and I think that's a wake-up call for us that we're going to need to adjust our systems. Thank you. I just I add one thing. Um, when we see a, a, a presidential move towards really taking data away from the CDC, it's an indication that not only should the conversations continue, but our capacity to utilize on regional and local levels, the data we have access to becomes all the more important because we don't know what the politicization, as Dr. Griffith pointed out, we don't know what that means for the broader context, but we certainly know what the data means in our Dr. Smallwood, I think we've lost you. You can't hear me? Uh, just can hear you now. And we've lost you again. Okay, I'm here. <laughs> okay. And I'm, I'm, I'm done. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Um, that was sort of a, a, a large, broad question. Um, another question that came in really is more individual. And um, the question is, I live in a suburb of Atlanta and curious about what I can do to make a difference in my community. Where do I start? Can I be can I just be blunt on this question? And just from, from my point of view, um, wear a mask when you're in public would be the number one thing. I don't, I'm not, I know that sounds a little bit joking, but um, you know, I think that is probably just compliance with that. Um, and knowing the choice uh, that, that making a, a mask in public is not just about protecting um, yourself from other people, it's the exact opposite. It's about protecting other people from you. I mean, that's why I'm wearing a mask here. I don't wear a mask here to protect me from Aaron, but we, you know, I'm protecting my patients. So I think the, you know, that that's one thing um, is just be a champion and wear that mask. So. Thank you. Another thing you can do is lobby your local officials uh, for how they use the funds that are available to them uh, right now because of COVID uh, and to make sure that those funds are used in ways that promote equity in your community. Yeah, I think just another very basic thing in addition to wearing a mask, encouraging others to wear masks, um, keep yourself abreast of whatever's going on in your community and within the networks that you have, making sure that you're um, taking care of or you're keeping abreast of who's, you know, not maybe doing as well as, as others or not having the same access to different things and so forth. And the reason that, that in the context of your question about equity um, matters is because it's really going to be through these networks that you're going to be able to have some influence and through your social networks and connections, excuse me, <clears throat> that you'll be able to potentially have some influence. 
I mean, I think it's, you know, I'm not certainly going to um, try to, to talk about sort of community organizing in this space, but I think it's, it's really thoughtful and important to think through how you, um, you know, sort of walk the talk in this kind of space. And so just by, you know, when you do go in public doing the things that, that um, are recommended, <clears throat> excuse me, from public health professionals and by encouraging others within your network to do the same, um, does set a tone that can actually be very beneficial and important, but also checking on those and making sure that you're supporting those who don't have the same opportunities to be healthy, that you do that as well is really important. I'd say the, uh, this pandemic has highlighted really how the needs are different across communities. And uh, I think that's really important to wherever you are to consider what the needs are specific to your community. Um, different states and local governments are passing policies that are different. Um, the benefits to certain communities are, are different and the way those resources are being distributed are different um, as are certainly the the impact of the disease itself. So uh, making sure that you actually understand what the community's needs are. Uh, many community organizations uh, are suffering greatly right now. They've not received um, a lot of funds and support. Their volunteers uh, aren't able to uh, support them in different ways. They've not had the, the ability and the capacity to sort of shift to virtual operations. Uh, and so I, I would begin with a question, uh, and that is asking the community uh, what is needed. Let me move to the next question. In addition to assistance with abiding by the CDC COVID-19 guidance, what health equity issues related to children in school settings, virtual or traditional, can, should community health entities help address? Well, I can give a, uh, I don't know if I have the answer to that question. Um, but I have a example that happened to me yesterday. Um, one of the principals from one of the local um, local elementary schools um, called me yesterday and was there, you know, developing their plan to reopen their school and, you know, how that looks. Um, you know, somebody had mentioned earlier about the use of tele, uh, te uh, you know, tele uh, technology to uh, connect with students and. Sometimes that is or is not a possibility. One of the big concerns that um, she had was um, that when students are come to school, sometimes they they you know the students get themselves ready for school, they walk to school, they get to school, they come into school, and they have a fever. Um, what what are we as a community going to do to um, to help her when kids come in sick and they? Um, have the option of, you know, calling patient parents than to tell the parents to come and pick up the child and come bring them home. But sometimes the parents are working. I mean, there's just so many factors that are just almost overwhelming. How can we step in and help parents and help these children do that? I mean, that would be more of a way to clarify the question. So I, I'm very interested to hear the other panelists and what their responses are um, to, to how they would address that, because that could be something I could immediately take today and take back to, to my colleague um, in the school. Yeah, I'm not gonna try to tackle that part, um, but I, I do want to um, just highlight the, the interconnection between sort of public health and education. And one of the things that, that is a huge concern is how the educational gap in terms of attainment um, is likely to grow because everybody's not going to have the same opportunity to be able to take advantage of whatever version of schooling is going to be available, you know, you know, in elementary schools in the fall. And so you're, you know, some people are not, gonna, it's not really going to be realistic for them to be as effective as students 
um, in a virtual environment um, with potentially some more limitations in terms of um, being able to utilize technology and then be, you know, being expected to be able to be successful in those spaces, we know that that's not equally accessible and available to everyone. So I think we're seeing sort of this interconnection of these issues that, you know, this public health problem is really going to lead to potentially a further crisis in um, educational attainment, as well as the mental health stressors that we're seeing coming out of people just constantly and just the mental health issues that we're seeing. So we're, so it's, you know, I would expect that we're going to see a lot more of these kinds of other issues that are going on um, in addition to just the, the pragmatics and the difficult pragmatics of how do you actually keep people safe um, in this environment and what do you do with these, you know, with kids in these spaces when social distancing and these kind of things are not an option. I do worry that we actually have very little understanding of what is happening to uh, many children um, as it relates to their education, their their physical well-being, and certainly their mental well-being. Um, we we know that people there there's so many things that are different. The size of your home, uh, your apartment, wherever you live, the amount of space you have to actually exercise, the opportunities you have to be physically active, uh, and you know whether or not you have broadband access to do whatever you need to do, whether or not your 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 parents or guardians are essential workers, and leaving now, you know, um, younger children. Uh, ch children home to take care of other younger children and really supervise them in any uh, learning um, uh, curriculum. Uh, th there's so many things that we haven't even begun to understand uh, that are that will will place people uh, for generations um, farther behind, but also at at more risk for health, uh, worse health outcomes long term and. And it's something that, that I and I know many other people have been worried about that, uh, that we need to address this and not in a way that we're just studying it, but that we're immediately providing some interventions. Uh, and, and I don't know, you know where that funding is coming from. It doesn't look like it's going to be coming from the Department of Education. Um, I, I don't know. And, and it is something that we should all be worried about. It's a tremendously difficult problem, and I don't have solutions, but let me just add to the problems. Um, a lot of uh, kids get their basic nutrition at school uh, from school breakfast and, and lunch programs. And so if they're not able to go to school, they need that basic source of nutrition. There are also huge inequities between kind of crowded, typically urban schools and and suburban schools that might have a lot of space and be able to socially distance and uh, keep kids kids apart enough uh, to to reopen. Um, so the tremendously difficult uh, questions, and I wish I had answers. Well, let me uh, offer another hard question because that's why we're here. I've heard at least theories as to why there were protests and more upset than usual after the recent racist incidents. One, people were cooped up from quarantine and were ready, already outraged at the coronavirus situation. So protesting was a good opportunity to get out and let out anger. And B, or two, while in lockdown, people got to realize with more clarity how racist this country is. What do you think of these ideas, panelists? I think that um, being at home or um, the conditions um, that people are having to function in due to the uh, pandemic has required you to sit still, maybe more than typical. I think it's easy to ignore some of the tragedies that happen on a, on a regular basis. 
uh, because you, you convince yourselves that you're too busy or that you have too many other priorities to really pay attention. Uh, and I think because people were home and uh, really uh, couldn't, to the degree that they have in the past, ignore it, um, uh, add it to that. And, and I'm sure really the, the shocking disparities in, in COVID-19 also sort of prepared people to, um, as hearing all of these really devastating um, differences in outcomes, uh, probably had people in a different place. I'd add another explanation, just film. You know, when, when it feels like a he said, she said sort of story when the police give you one account and the people uh, who are victimized give you another account, um, it's too easy to say, well, you know, I really don't know what happened and I sort of believe the police. When we see the horrific videos uh, that were be are coming out and how many other people are not filmed, um, it's really hard to turn one's back. Uh, and I think that uh, just as the in the civil rights era, the pictures of the dogs poses uh, galvanized people, the pictures that we're seeing of brutality um, have galvanized people again. Yeah, I, I guess my reaction is, I don't know that I would see these protests are more than usual. I mean, I think I'm thinking back to 2016, 17, where you had similar footage of equally horrific um, death by legal, uh, legal intervention, which is the, the CDC term for um, people dying of, um, at the hands of the police. Um, you saw, you know, in Atlanta and other places, you know, mass protests and so forth. It's just that now other folks have started to, then the main people who are affected by it are now starting to also get galvanized and organized as part of this. But I don't know that um, the people who are most affected by it are necessarily more or less upset. It's just that I think folks who hadn't previously gotten upset are finally, you know, kind of at a point where maybe they're seeing this as not an avoidable thing to be able to ignore. The other concern that I have, though, you know, is we're seeing a lot of progress in areas that don't have anything to do with what prompted the issue in the first place. So we're seeing a lot of, you know, there's people are doing a lot to sort of, you know, um, change the name of this and get rid of that and all these kinds of things and so forth. But they're not, we're not dealing collectively with the issues of, you um, why are people dying at the hands of the police in, in instances where they're unarmed and it's unnecessary? So that has gotten missed in this conversation. And we're sort of, you know, as, as a colleague of mine, uh, Marino Bruce used to say, there's a lot of hand waving and flailing around that sort of is garnering our attention over here, but it's not really dealing with the main issue that we're dealing with. So I just would encourage us to kind of stay focused on what do we need to do to address these core issues that have been, um, we're kind of getting distracted from in some of these other ways. Yeah, and I don't think I have anything to add other than I, I somewhat disagree with the people being cooped up in quarantine being outraged. I like how Dr. Wilkins explained it more of it's given us time to think about um, our priorities and it taking us out of our sort of comfort of going day to day and just doing what's in you know, just, you know, doing what, what is natural and um, usual for us. Um, and so, uh, and then also, I mean, I, you know, and then what Dr. Shen said about, you know, the images, I mean, it, you know, you'd have to be, you know, blind and deaf and, and, and completely incoherent not to see, you know, the, the facts in front of your, in front of your face. What I just worry about are, I can't understand why, you know, with these facts that there's not more, progress in, um, in the current direction. Thank you. The next question. Um, and this is a, a version of a question that comes up in the um, deans of the university's council meeting um, of late. 
please discuss effective strategies to get younger people to adopt public safety needs during the COVID crisis. I guess I would say it's a, a challenge for me to just um, place all of that in the uh, space of younger people. I think I've seen some really very responsible uh, younger people and my, my experience has been more of uh, you know, li living in the suburb of, of Nashville and working in Nashville uh, and seeing different laws and priorities there. Uh, I, I see young people in some places who are very much following the rules and, and, and everybody in some places not following the rules. So I, I don't know how fair it is to just put that uh, blame and emphasis on, on younger people. I will say that um, we could do a better job of, of communicating consistently. And I think when you have um, so many different messages coming from leaders. Um, we shouldn't be surprised that in a pandemic with a new virus where information is constantly changing, that uh, people have trouble uh, keeping up, understanding, and believing it if we're not all on the same page. And so I think it, it, it needs to start with uh, really leaders being responsible uh, and consistent with messaging. I would go back to, to, just to build off of what Dr. Wilkins said, I would kind of go back to my initial analogy of the blind men and the elephant, or blind people and the elephant, of basically just saying that this is another way that we're making an assumption that, that youth or age matters and that young people are necessarily doing worse than, than others. And so I don't know that that's necessarily the case and we haven't necessarily demonstrated that. I think there are other factors that may be more at play or bigger sort of in issues and points that we need to deal with. Being on a college campus, clearly we're very concerned about our students, um, you know, and, and that is sort of the, the proverbial elephant in the room, if you will, as a, as a Vanderbilt community. But it, from that standpoint, I think there are a lot of strategies simply by working within, again, the networks of students to help each other, hold each other accountable and to have those kinds of, you know who students listen to, you know who they follow, you know who their networks are, and if you can sort of work within those networks that they know, obviously we may not know, but certainly they know who they listen to and who they will listen to. And if you can tap into those colleagues and peers of theirs um, and to work with them to, again, get them to sort of walk the talk, I think that may be an important strategy to start with. Well, thank you all. I am noticing that we are at our, or near at our time. Um, and this hour, as I predicted, has flown past. But I really want to thank each one of you for your willingness to stop by and have this uh, conversation. Um, clearly, it's a beginning in many ways, even though we're in the midst of a pandemic that we don't know when will end. Um, and so I think in some ways the kind of uh, unknown is driving so many of the ways we try to provide good health care um, to populations that already don't receive good health care or certainly not consistent health care. So as we end, um, I wanna commend each one of you for the work you do and uh, stay healthy, please. Um, and, and, and keep up the good work. It's uh, necessary, it's needed. Um, and I also wanna thank um, Dar for providing this space and this time and particularly the good folks uh, in alumni relations. You all rock. Until the next time, Everyone take care, please. Thank you.